Good morning, everyone. This is Brother Dial from Fleming Island, Florida. I want to greet everyone today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thanking and praising Him for uh, what He's done in our day. How that He has taken the veil off of the Word and reveal the true revelation of Jesus Christ. It's back to the to the to the pure word once again without anybody's interpretation. It's just like that God wanted it to be in the beginning until man got in it and uh, made it his book. But it's not man's book, it's God's book. So uh, we know that God fulfills His Word by bringing it to pass, and that's His interpretation. So what He's written in the book, He's brought to pass, and uh, you can look and see the manifestation of it, and that is His interpretation. No matter what, they continue to say that, well, you know, this, that, and the other. Well, we don't pay any attention to that. We have been brought back. We have been returned to the to the Word of God just like it was given and it come by the Word of God come to the prophet of God and he give it out to the people that was God's program and it's still God's program and will be his program as long as we are here so we thank the Lord for that let's pray Lord we thank you again today we thank you for watching over your word Lord to perform it to reveal it and lord surely you have in our day so we're so thankful lord to be living in this day when lord uh, the mysteries have been revealed all the things that the people wondered about and and probed at and tried this that and the other but lord you have just come on the scene and so simply just revealed it to those who can receive it so we thank you for that and we pray that you'll now once again be with us today to continue the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And today <clears throat> I want to take, uh, well to give this a title, uh, the Bible became a, a new book. And people say, oh wow, goodness. Well, it became a new book. The words didn't change. If you read it uh, before the seals and after the seals, the word didn't change. But what changed was our understanding because now we have the true understanding just as God wanted to give it without all this guesswork and well I, this sounds pretty good and this sounds okay well uh, that was okay because he winked a long time at man's ignorance but he knew there would come a time when he would reveal the whole thing and he has that is history and now we are enjoying the complete revelation of Jesus Christ but some people, they're still, well, well, what about this and what about that? And we're waiting for this. Well, you just keep on waiting. We'll just keep on enjoying what God has done and what he has revealed to us. So praise the Lord for that. Now, I've chosen to read uh, for this portion. I want to read out of Galatians 1. Chapter 1, I want to start with verse 10, and uh, we want to draw some things from this reading, and this is Paul, he's, he's talking about uh, his conversion and so on, and so uh, let's just read this and then we'll go on from there. So Galatians 1.10, and I'm reading down to verse 17. For do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Amen, Brother Paul. 
Move here. We're not looking here where he wasn't and we're not. Because the same spirit that was in Paul has come on the believer this day and we're not interested in pleasing men. There is our one thing is to please God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. And he wanted to make sure you got this. This wasn't coming from a man. He said, I certify that this is not after man. For neither, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. Well, my goodness, if you didn't get it from man, where did you get it from? Who? What? How, how did you get it? Well, he, he gives the answer. <laughs> but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he didn't receive it of man, neither was I taught, but I got it from Jesus Christ by revelation. For you have heard of my conversation in time past. In the Jews' religion, and that's all it was, was a religion was they used to cover their sins with. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and he did. And I profited in the Jews' religion above my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. Now look at here. What was he? What was he? he? Now this is his testimony. He's telling what happened to him. But he said, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions, not of the God's word, what God had wrote down. But Paul, before his conversion, he was all about the traditions of the fathers. Thank God he got a birth. And thank God that we got a birth to take us out of the traditions of religion and of churches into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 15. But when it pleased God, and that is the whole thing. It's, it's not about when you, it's about when He, God Himself, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me. God does his own calling and choosing by his grace. What was it, what was it all about? Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach among the heathen. Who is the heathen? The unbeliever. Immediately... I conferred not with flesh and blood. In other words, he didn't have to run back to the high priest and say, oh, high priest or whoever priest or whatever. He didn't do that. Neither, and this one, he didn't go back there and he didn't go over there. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them. Well, Jerusalem, that was, where the, that was the headquarters where the apostles and everybody were. Well, he didn't run over there. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus because he went out and got along with God and God gave him the revelation and that's what he wrote the word. Now think about this. Moses, he wrote the first five books. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. And come on the scene this day and God's got a prophet on the scene to reveal the book. And that's the only way he can do it is by a prophet. Thank God he sent a vindicated prophet, William Branham. Now, I've read that, but I'm going to... This, this, is, <clears throat> this is a little 
just a little drop in here, and I'm going to answer a question that a, a brother had sent me, and he asked me a question about polygamy. I don't know, maybe where he lives, uh, it's, it's legal, it's still in effect. Well, a lot of them would like for it to be legal over here in America, but it's not. In most places in the world, it's not. But there are nations where you can absolutely have as many wives as you can afford. And Brother Brown, he preached a whole long message on marriage and divorce, and it shows you how a man can take the truth and ball it all up and twist it up. And, and when they've read that, they come out with, you could... You could be a polygamist. You could have as many wives as you wanted to. Can you believe that? Well, that's what happened. So it shows that it's the devil in the details. But now, <clears throat> I wanted to answer this just this, uh, real quick and briefly here. And when he asked me this question, I thought about, I thought about just a couple of scriptures that I think if, if you would take these scriptures and you would take them to heart and believe them, it would settle the whole matter. It would it'd be over that quick. But, of course, we know they won't. But I was thinking about Genesis chapter 2. And the thing about Brother Brown said, when God makes a decision, when He decides to do a thing in a certain way, that is His that is his first and final decision. He's not going to change his mind about it. So he said, if you want to go with and see where all these things started, he said, go back to Genesis. And so that's where we are. Now, let's see how this all got started here. This is Genesis 2, 18. He says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. Because remember, he, he created Adam. He was walking around the garden and he seen everybody else had their mates, but he didn't have one. And he, he said that he should be alone. I will make him an A-N help meet for him. Okay, he's going to make Adam... A help me. He said, and he's going to make him one help meet. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman. How many did he make? He made a woman, one woman, and brought her unto the man. Brought her, not them. Now remember, he's not going to change his mind. I don't care what or who says different. Verse 23. And Adam said... This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay? So God sees Adam and he's, he's alone and he wants to take care of him. And he made him one woman. That is God's perfect will. And now we come along down here after supposedly they got the revelation and they can have a dozen. Does that make any sense? Not, not, not any to me, but evidently it does to some. Now, well, you know, well, what happened? Well, something happened. Well, let, let's go over just a little bit further in Genesis here. And we can, we can see where all this stuff come from. But it, it didn't come in the garden. God had, had the garden fixed up. All right, let's go to Genesis 4. And we want to read like three verses here. 
actually 16 through 19. And this, to me, just caps the whole thing. Now, Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out of the presence of the Lord. Cain went out of the presence of, and I'll tell you what, Cain's people, his offspring, his lineage is still out of the presence of the Lord. The, how can you be out of the presence? Just believe what God has said. So now Cain went out of the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And Enoch was born Irad. And Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methusiel, and Methusiel begot Lamech. Okay, now we're getting on now. Look here, verse 19. And look here, it's only been just a few generations since he was kicked out of the garden when out of the presence of the Lord. Verse 19. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Well, my goodness. Here he is. He can't get by with just one helpmate. He's got to have two. And Laban took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adea, and the name of the other was Zilia. Okay? So here we go. He's just got over there to himself because you know Cain is Satan's son and he's a perverter of the word. He is not going to follow God's rule, God's way, God's nothing because he's got his own way. And so does his followers. So they just got out of there and went just a few generations and here already one of them has already taken two wives. Contrary to what happened over there in, in Genesis with, with Adam and, and Eve. God's perfect plan over there. But see, they're over here. They're not in the perfect plan of God. They're in the perverted plan of God. And so that's the whole thing in a nutshell right there. And, I, and listen to this. Polygamy was started in Genesis by Cain's offspring. And I want you to just listen to this. Now Noah, Noah was 2,000 years from the garden. And it said Noah had one wife. 2,000 years later, Noah had one wife. And his sons had one wife apiece. That's how that there was eight people that got on the ark. So 2,000 years from the garden down to where Noah is, he still got one wife. And over here, just in a few verses, you know, Cain's bunch has already got taken two. And they kept on and they took as many as they wanted. Oh, you say, well, Israel had polygamy. Yeah, because they got in the, in the very nature of the world around them. It was not God's perfect will, and it never will be. Because, Brother Brown said, there has a restored Eden. So, we got a restored Eden, and we're going to go around with five or six or a dozen wives. It, it, it ain't going to work. You've got one, and that's yours. He said, when you get a revelation that that's your wife, he said, that is your <laughs> wife. And he made this statement. He said, it's just like the curse of sin is all gone when the Holy Ghost accepts you. 
It accepts you. You don't accept it. So it makes a difference. Now, and I hope that answers the brother's question. Amen. Now, going back over to the Bible became a new book. And I want to start with some things here uh, out of the message. Some quotes that Brother Brown give. And we can work our way down to the, to the new book. And I was reading, or actually I was listening to this message the other day, and I heard these things, and I come back and I looked them up, and I want to share them with you today. Now this is in a message going beyond the camp there in Jeffersonville, 1964. And he, he starts out by saying, he said, My subject for this evening is going beyond the camp. It's quite a little subject, a little odd, but, you know, usually we find God in odd things. The world gets so set in a custom thing till anything irregular from the regular trend becomes odd. And amen, Brother Brown. As I preached a few days ago here at the Tabernacle on the oddball he said, the farmer is an oddball to the businessman. The businessman is an oddball to the farmer. The Christian is an oddball to the unbeliever, and so forth. You have to be somebody's fool. So anything unusual makes you a fool to the regular trend. So when we come out and we buck the, the regular trend, of the message and of religion and everything else, they call us a fool. Huh. And therefore, God's people and His prophets and His messengers through the age that carried His message from the Word has been considered fool to the outside. Amen. And every time you come with the real, real, true revelation of God, you're going to be called a fool, a nut, an oddball, or something else. And the only one that can accept it is the one that are part of it. Then he goes on. He said, Noah was a fool to his great intellectual world. Jesus, look here. No one was a fool. They thought that poor old guy had, had lost it. He's out here talking about rain. He's out here building on this big old boat and all this stuff. And they just thought, well, he's gone off his rocker. Well, Noah was a fool to, to that day. And look here, not only that, but when Jesus come on the scene, he was a fool to the, the religious people of his day. They called him ever a name in the book and said he's mad, he's crazy, he's got a devil. But let me ask the question, whose fool are you? Yeah. So, that's what happens when you, you get out of the, the regular trend. And look here. When, when you receive the revelation of Jesus Christ, you are not in the regular trend. You, in the, you are in the supernatural realm of God. Now, still in this message going beyond the camp. And he makes this statement. And remember, Brother Brown, 19, from 1963, after the seals right on through, until the end of it, he was on the road going the nation back and to, back and to. I don't know how in the world they done it back in that day to run from one from the East Coast to the West Coast, but they did. He said, now, more and more I am made to believe that people are not getting to Christ. And I ask this question, why, Brother Brown? Why are they not, all this preaching and all these big ministries and everything else, all this going on in this day? Remember, this is 1964. We had Billy Graham, we had Oral Roberts, we had all these other evangelists, and they was just running wild everywhere. So we asked the question, 
Now, I am here to try to help in every way that I can and make my statement as clear as I know how to make them. And you suffer with me. And as I preach across the nation and watch the people, I am fully persuaded that the people are not getting to Christ. I believe that the enemy, who is our enemy, it's Satan, the word perverter, our, it's the enemy that's thrown it this hindrance. Because this is the answer why they're not getting to Christ. Because the reason I believe this he is he who he who Christ he is not the object that has been pointed to they have either been pointed to a dogma oh yeah we've got a lot of those and boy they, they've been building them up for how many hundreds of years and it's become part of the whole Christian but it's not the true believers part They've been pointed to a, a dogma or a doctrine or a party or an experience or a sensation or something like that instead of being pointed to Christ the Word. They give the reason. How come they're not getting to Christ? Because they're not been pointed to Christ. They've been pointed to something else to a dogma, a doctrine, a tradition, everything but Christ. Because Christ is the Word. That's why I think the people are resting their eternal destination upon some dogma or some sensation. Like sometimes somebody said, well, I danced in the Spirit. I spoke with tongues. I felt fire run over me. And do you know all those things can be impersonated by the devil? Amen. And he does. And they fall for it over and over and over again. Then he goes on. He said, it seems today to be the day when people are going beyond the camp and everything they're going beyond. You know, I was told some time ago that they had a jet plane now that can make them noises that we hear around here that shakes the windows. It's when the plane goes, goes so fast that it crosses its own sound and it's called the sound barrier. And when it goes beyond its own sound, it's almost unlimited to what it'll do. And I think in there that we get a lesson when we go beyond our own sound barrier into the Word of God, then it's unlimited what God can do with a man that's ready to go beyond the camp, the camp of man. Yes, go beyond the camp of man and get into the camp of God. And when you get there, you're into an unlimited power. You have broke through the veil of tradition and dogma and everything else. And you are free to soar in the heavenlies. But look here. First, you have to do, you've got to get out of there. Now, the Bible became a new book. And how did this Bible become a new book? Did this one day, did it, whoa. Well, let's, let's read here a few statements and we're going to see how this happened. Now, this is how the, the Feast of the Trumpets there in Jeffersonville, 1964. He said, now, then when we got finished with the book of Revelation of the church, what, did, what God did to those seven churches which were then in their infancy or the shadow in Asia Minor. Then the Holy Spirit revealed and opened to us all the mysteries in there of how He has brought His church through history. And if you don't have the seven 
church age is on tape, it would be good if you would listen to them and soon they'll be out in book, they'll be in book form. And he was talking about that they were going to have that, that's what we call now the church age book. And somebody said, oh, that's Lee Vale's book. I beg your pardon. Brother Brown said, that is my book. Now, then he said, just leaving it, leaving it at that and presuming after a while we would preach on the seals not knowing what the seals was. Okay, so he's made a statement. Look here, we've, we've done the church age, we've done that. And he said, we're going to preach on the seals, but I have, I don't know what the seals are. And then we go to the second seal. He got a statement. He said, and now tonight we are studying this second seal. And for the first four seals, there is four horse riders. And I tell you today, something happened again. Something that, he said, I go and get an old script. Whoa, go get an old script. That I had talked on long ago and just sat down and I thought, well, I'll, I'll do the very best I could. And many writers and things and I thought, well, I'll read a little while and look over and see this and that. And the first thing you know, something, something just happens and it's altogether different. Yes, it's altogether different because, Brother Brown, you have got to fulfill and manifest Revelations 10, 7, the very mystery of God is to be finished. Something just happened. It's all together. It just comes different. Then I grab my pencil right quick and start writing down just as fast as I can. Now, what was he doing? Because he didn't know what the seal was, so he's sitting there, well, uh, what, what am I going to do? And he goes back to an old script. Well, the old script won't work. And that's what is the problem that they're not getting people to Christ. Is they're still reading from the old script. They're reading from the old church age script of denominations. Look here, a doc, denomination doctrine, I don't care how much Bible you miss with it, you make the whole thing into a lie and it cannot free anybody from the devil. Oh, but they think it can. So, look here. God could, could change Brother Brown's mind. He could show him the complete revelation. And look here. I don't care what God does or what He backs up or what He proves, they still hold on to the old script. They won't get out of the camp of man and come into the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what they need to do with the old script? They need to set it on fire. They need to burn it and then scatter the ashes so it'll never bother anybody again. But no, rather than do that, they towed it around with them and calling it the revelation of Jesus Christ, the message. Oh my. Went out of the presence of the Lord. After the seals opened, Brother Branham said, as they was open, he said, something just happens. It's altogether different. Oh, my, well, you know, they don't want anything different. Well, you know, we've had this for hundreds of years. Well, so what? You've had a mixed up gospel that the devil got in it. Look here. It went from, went from Christian to pagan to mix it all up and to believe this and take the word and go from one God to three gods and everything else after that was just a complete shamble. And the people believed it. And the thing about it, the great majority of the day still believe it. But look here. There's none of God's people. No, none of God's people that's got their name on the book believe anything like that. 
They believe what God has done in this day because they were called out by that. Now, this here is the first seal. And I want to read this because it shows how the prophet was. That he was, he was not so set in his ways that he couldn't be corrected like men are today. You try to correct them and rather than them say praise the Lord, they'll get mad and cuss you. Now, this is in the first seal there in Jeffersonville. And now the Lamb is standing now tonight as we enter into this sixth chapter. He's got the book in his hand and starting to reveal it. And oh, I would absolutely today, and I hope that people are spiritual, I would have had a horrible mistake on that if it hadn't have been about 12 o'clock today when the Holy Spirit came in the room and corrected me. What? He said, look here, I would have had a, a horrible mistake. But God is watching over His Word. He's watching over the revelation of Jesus Christ. And He said, the Holy Spirit came in the room and corrected on me on something that I was writing down to say. And I was taking it from an old context. Now, because, look here. He was taking it because he's in there studying and he's using his past history and so on that he's been involved with, which was contrary to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he said he was taking it from an old context and the Holy Spirit come in there and said, boom, corrected him. said, no, no, not that. He said, I had nothing on it. I don't know what the second seal is, no more than nothing. But I got some old context and something that I spoke on several years ago and wrote it down. And I gathered this context. Dr. Smith and many great outstanding teachers, he said, I've gathered them all and I believe that. So I wrote it down and I was fixing to say, well, I was studied from that standpoint. And there about 12 o'clock, in the day, the Holy Spirit just swept right down into the room and the whole thing just opened up to me. And there it was, the first seal being opened. Now, isn't that wonderful that God, a prophet with a ministry that still can be corrected by the Holy Spirit, and that's the trouble today. People don't want to be corrected. They say, well, you know, Papa believed this, and Mama believed this, and my church believed this, and my church is hundreds of years old. I mean, they will not be corrected. And these seals was revealed by God Himself. And the only way that He can reveal it and get them out to us he has to have a prophet on the scene for the word to come to, to give out to the people. That is his way, and he's not going to leave it. And he didn't. And thank God Brother Branham was true to his mission. He didn't try to please man. He had one ob object, and that was to please God. And that should be our one object too, to please Jesus Christ. Now, I'm reading these things to show that we, we as people, as individuals, we have our, we have our own thoughts. But look here, our thoughts have to give away to his thoughts. And some of them, well, you know, that sounds pretty good. But it might sound pretty good, but if it's not the 100% truth, it ain't worth nothing. Now, and I want to read this out of the Broken Cisterns there in Jeffersonville, 1964, and it'll bring us to some real truth here if you can receive it. And Brother Brown is talking about him and Brother Vale. They're having this conversation. 
and he drops some real to me some real important points in this little dialogue here. So let's read what he says. He said, today I was talking with my good friend, Dr. Lee Vail, who is present now, and he's quite a theologian. You know, I believe if, if I'd have been old Dr. Vail and Brother Brown was telling the whole crowd that I was quite a theologian, I said, wait a minute, Brother Brown, I used to be a theologian. I'm not anymore because the word don't come to theologians. And so we usually have some pretty good discussions on the scriptures. And he's very smart. And he asked me one time what I thought about the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost was. Was it speaking in tongue? And it's been many years ago. I said, no, I can't see that. He said, neither do I. And said, though I've been taught that, he said, what would you think would be an evidence? And I said, well, the most perfect evidence that I can think of is love. And so we got to talking on that. And then I thought that sounded pretty good. So I just held that. If a man's got love, and that's what they're talking about today. If a man's got love, oh, he's, he's in there. That, that's the true evidence. But let's get a little further with what he said. He said, I thought that was pretty good and I helped to that. But one day the Lord in a vision straightened me out. Oh my. One day the Lord in the vision straightened me out and said that the evidence, now this is the Lord himself that's telling him this in a vision that said <clears throat> the evidence of the Spirit was those who could receive the word, neither love nor speaking in tongues, but it was receiving the word. My, 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 my. How about that? And look here, it's too bad the preachers today, you couldn't straighten them out with a steamroller because they refuse to be straightened. They get a hold of some old thought, some old doctrine, some old tradition, some old this, that, or the other, and they'll hold on to it until their dying day. But look at here. The prophet, he was so malleable that he could be straightened out. He could be corrected because he knew who was doing the correcting and the straightening. But not this people. They have, they have no, 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 no revelation of what God has done and is doing that it's not me or you. It is Jesus Christ that is doing it. He's the only one that can do it. And he's doing it to reveal himself to his people. Now, so still in this broken cisterns here, and then Dr. Bell was saying to me, well, you know, that is scriptural. He said, because in John 14, Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost has come, he will reveal these things to you that I've taught, and you will show you things to come. So there is the genuine evidence of the Holy Ghost. He has never told me anything wrong yet. Glory to God, Brother Branham. We are resting on that. That it is the evidence of the Holy Ghost is He who can believe the Word, you can receive it. And then, it's even according to Jesus Himself that that is the evidence according to Jesus Himself. Praise the Lord. So, He can be straightened. Well, why can't these other people be straight? They don't want to be straight. They want to continue on just like the Pharisees continue on after Jesus, just like the Sadducees and just like the Lutherans and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Pentecostals. They just carry right on. They won't get straight. The only way to get straight is to get the new birth and you'll be straight. 
You know, the first thing that happened to Paul when he and when he got his eyes, he went to a street called Straight. Wonder why that was. Well, look here. When you get your eyes open, you will go to a street that is called Straight. God will get you straight. But people. They refuse. You know why? Because it's a it's a it's a it's a closed and a narrow way, and few there be that get on the straight. Now, feast of the trumpets there in 1964. Then one day in Sabino Canyon, while God called me early in the morning up there. I was up with my hands in the air praying, and a sword came into my hands. You know that. I stood there and looked at it just as natural as my hand is now, not knowing what it meant. And it left me with a voice that said, This is the sword of the king. And then later, when the angel of the Lord revealed it, it was the word in the hand. And immediately after that, the angels of the Lord appeared and told about the, the seven seals that I was to return back here to Jeffersonville and preach the seven seals. And there, if I've ever said anything that was inspired, it was in that. That's where the angel of the Lord met us and the Bible became a new book. That's where, when he was preaching these seals, when that Holy Spirit was coming there, an angel every day was coming in there with the true revelation of Jesus Christ. And he said, <clears throat> during this time, he said, the Lord met us and, and the Bible became a new book. And what else? He said, there it opened and revealed all the things that the reformers and things had left out. It was a complete revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what he said? It was, not will be, it was a complete revelation of Jesus Christ, altogether new to us. Amen. It was the new that people couldn't have it. They couldn't take it. They stayed with the old book. They stayed with the old script. They stayed with the old text. They couldn't move up to the new because why? They were not part of it. And he said, altogether new to us, but perfectly, exactly with the scriptures. That was the word which has always been. I was so inspired and directed. Now, so we're, we're not following, we're not following the teachings of some man. We are following the very teachings and word and revelation of Jesus Christ that he used, just like he used Moses to bring the first five books, just like he used, he used Paul, he used Peter, he used all the writers of the New Testament, just like he used him. But now the time has come for the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. And he's got a person, he's got a prophet, he's got a man, William Branham, on the scene that he can trust to give it to, and he does, and he does not deviate he don't try to please man. He goes ahead and preaches the word just as God has given to him. And he said when he does this, the Bible becomes a new book because it's a brand new understanding without all this denominational makeup and mix-up and everything else. Whew. Today, if you listen to the people in the churches, oh, they're waiting, they're waiting all the fly off somewhere. When the prophet said, you don't fly off. He said, heaven is right here. They're waiting for graves to pop open. Well, look here. This is the grave that popped open. I wasn't out there in a graveyard. This was the graveyard here, this old flesh. And this is where the resurrection happened. And every other thing. But oh no, they're not going to have that. Brother Brown said, it ain't a bunch of angels. Look here. If you want to read this, I think it's in... 
uh, God in simplicity, he said, it ain't angels talking about the rat. He said, it ain't angels come down with shovels and dig out a grave and get some old carcass out of that. He said, if you have that, you will sin again. No, it's about a brand new you that can't sin, that was not born in sin, that is a part of the eternal God. Can God sin? Well, evidently some people think he can, but no. Now, <laughs> let's go a little bit further here. God is unveiled. I want to drop this in first so this gets right on your mind. God is unveiled. That's His Word made manifest. I'm reading out of a, the identified Christ of all ages. And that's what He was. He was identifying Himself to that generation. And now He has identified Himself to our generation. And until you come behind that old badger skin, until you get until you get out, and that's the problem. They don't want to get out. They want to bring it with them, toting around their old badger skin. Until you get out of your old skin, your old thoughts, oh my, 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 your old creeds, and come into the presence of God. No, they, they, they ain't no way they're going to give up all that to get in the presence. What happened to Cain? He went out of the presence because he refused the revelation that God had proved that was right. And come into the presence of God. Then the word becomes a living reality to you. When you get into the presence of God, the Word is, is made alive. It's a, it's a living reality. He said, then you're awakened to the Shekinah glory. And if you could just imagine the Word being made manifest, God coming on the scene, making it live, and it's becoming live, it's being manifested in flesh, and that is the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That was what was behind that veil where the priest went in once a year and he had to have blood even go in then to go into that Shekinah. Well, just think, we can live every day in the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ. You're living in His presence. The Bible, the Bible becomes a new book. Hey, when? When you get into that Shekinah presence, the Bible becomes a new book. Then Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're living in His presence, eating the shoe bread that only provided that day for believers, for priests only. We are the priests, royal priests to the holy nation, peculiar people giving spiritual sacrifice to God. But you must come in to behind the veil to see the unveiled God. And God is unveiled. That's His Word made manifest. But since the opening of those seals of those angels just behind the mountain yonder, this has become a new book. Praise the Lord. Something really happened. And it was some kind of illusion. It was a real happening that changed the prophet's mind that gave him the complete revelation of Jesus Christ and God vindicated, proved it, backed it up ever which way he could and the people still look at it and say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I know it's an absolute 100% truth of God what he has done, not going to do. So God is unveiled. That's his word made manifest. 
And that's what the believers are today. They are the Word made manifest. They are the Word in flesh. They are God's body upon the earth. God is living in that body just like He lived in that body of His 2,000 years ago. And when He lived in that body, it was called the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And when He's living in this body, it's called the fullness of the Godhead bodily, whether or not they believe it. Has not one thing to do with it. Now, I want to look over and get one more statement of this. And this is God's power to transform. God's power to transform. And remember, He is omnipotent. That means He has unlimited power. And He was preached there in Phoenix, Arizona, 1965. Now, he said it's hard to say this. It's very hard because you're speaking to people who feel the same way I do. And the way I have been for many years. But since the opening of those seven seals of them angels just behind the mountain yonder, this has become a new book. It's the thing that's been hid. And they were hid. Je what? Uh, who hid them? Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you hid these things from the wise and prudent, and you have revealed them unto babes, such as would learn. So, it couldn't be brought out during the church ages because it wasn't to be brought out there. It had a certain time and a certain place and a certain individual that was going to bring this out. He had already been chosen before the foundation of the world. Just as Paul said, the God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me. That's how much God knows about it. So... He said, But since the opening go of those seals just behind the mountain, you know, this has become a new book to the things that's been hid. It's being revealed as God promised in Revelations 10. In Revelations 10, he goes all the way down from one, one chapter, verse 1 to verse 7. And it's about the mighty angel coming down, putting his foot on earth and seeing, taking complete control. And all of a sudden, the thunders rung out and John was fixing to write. But he said, don't write them, John. Seal them up. And he did. And there were seven of them in Revelation chapter 6 and one over in one, Revelation chapter 8. And all he said, it was just silence. He said, don't write it, John. But in the days of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound when he starts to blow his trumpet the very mystery of God's will be finished and was he would do it and we are privileged amen we are privileged people that God has chosen of the earth that we might see and understand these things which is not some mythical, fleshly mind of a person trying to make it up. It's the Word of God made manifest, proven that it's right. Proven not by science, but by God that it's right. God, had, God as I have said before I mentioned, God doesn't need anyone to interpret His Word. He confirms it. That's His interpretation. So God is his own, and look, it's just so simple. He, he has somebody write the word, and it comes along, and he has the word manifested, and that is his interpretation of the word. And it becomes spiritual food in due season to those who can partake and eat of it. He preached the whole message on spiritual food in due season, but you know, there's only a certain people that can eat this spiritual food and it's eagle food. An eagle can eat it, but a chicken will choke on it. Why? Because it's not 
chicken food. It is eagle food. It is a complete revelation of Jesus Christ. And the complete revelation when people, when people get it, receive it, and actually put it in action will produce Jesus Christ. I don't know how it could be any more simpler. And it has, and it will, that God has come on the scene. And the Bible has become a brand new book. Look here, if you're reading the Bible with your old denominational interpretation, or your self-interpretation, or your own thoughts of this, look here, it'll never come. It'll never be real. But when God comes on the scene and reveals it, and you see it and you understand it, you say, glory to God. And that's what we have done this day. God has come on the scene and He's given us the complete revelation which was all together new to us because why? We'd never heard it before. All we had heard down through the ages is God done this and God done that and all that. And all we got, they got Him in history. They got Him in the future. But they can't accept the present tense, Jesus Christ, which is the Word made manifest. Amen. So it is a new book. And it's a book for God's people that He has chose before the foundation of the world. What a, what a great privilege. He said we are privileged people to be, able to, to be able to hear and see and believe what God has done in our day. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You once again today. Oh, Lord, what a, what a thing it is to be included in this great revelation for our day. To have such faith and confidence in what you have done. And, Lord, it wasn't, it wasn't to please man. It was all about pleasing you. And, Lord, you said we must have faith. We must have the revelation of Jesus Christ to please you. And Lord, surely you have given that to us this day. And Lord, we so thank, love, and praise you. We appreciate you, Lord, for including us, Lord, in this great thing. The, this is the greatest day of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the complete revelation of you, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.